We're welcome. Live. We're live at Pandemicus. Uh, welcome to Pandemicus. We have here with us uh, Mjiba uh, Prahiwat. Uh, the, uh, I think she's uh, at the University of Ghana. We have uh, Melvin Burgess, the writer. Uh, I think he's up somewhere in Hebden Bridge, uh, England. We have Todman and Pete. Oh, oh Todman and you moved. That's Hebden true. Bridge. <laughs> oh, well, moving thank up you, thank you for that. <laughs> we have Tariq Mahmoud of the University of Beirut, American University of Beirut, uh, but also uh, residing in England at the moment. And I'm Pete Kalu, the writer. Uh, the subject for today is Black Lives Matter, writing the struggle. We've got also with us, who she will be joining us, Colette Williams, a writer and activist. Uh, so we're going to move very quickly to our very first question. Uh, welcome, Colette. And we're moving to our very first question of Majiba. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on the most recent protests around Black Lives Matter? Well, thank you so much for um, having me on the show. I'm very um, excited to share my thoughts and greetings from Ghana. Um, we hope that you all are having a positive day. Um, so I think this is a very interesting question. You know, what, um, you know, what, how do we contextualize the current uprisings and rebellions um, that started in the United States, but really spread throughout the world. And I think we have to look at it historically, right? And I'll just be very brief with this. This, you know, iteration of Black Lives Matter um, certainly takes us back to 2014 and 2016, but it, it takes us much farther beyond that. This is really just a continuation of struggle of African, and black and brown and African people and all oppressed people against capitalism, against imperialism, and, and ultimately against the militarization of police and police violence. Um, and and if, you, if you look at, um, for example, the trajectory of the anti-imperialist, um, anti-colonial movements in the continent, we see very similar conditions um, that, we, that we're seeing now um, in the United States. If you look at the Palestinian issue currently, we see very similar conditions in regards to police repression and the militarization of police. And so I would suggest, um, and I'll, 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 I'll end after this, I would suggest that this sort of new reiteration of Black Lives Matter is, is not just because George Floyd was killed and he was you know, suffocated under nine minutes. That's not it. It's not just because Breonna Taylor was killed in her bed or Ahmad was shot on the streets of Georgia, but it's more so a continuation of the, the repression and oppression of African people at the hands of U US imperialism, both in the US as well as neocolonialism outside of the US. And so, so th that's, those are my initial thoughts about this, this current uh, phase of the movement. So, um, Jiva, can, can, could I ask you a, a more narrow uh, question about that? In that, in yeah. America, how much do you how much do you think that it's um, it's got something to do with a, a, something that everyone's hoped for? I suppose a backlash against Trump in a broader political. Yeah. I, I, so I th okay. So I do think that there's some somewhat of a backlash against Trump. Um, but I also think that under under the Obama administration is when the 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 real not real but when the 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 Black Lives Matter took root, right? Because we have to remind ourselves that this is the Black Lives Matter was birthed after Trayvon Martin, right? Um, uh, after um, Mike Brown. This is under the Obama administration. So while it's certainly a backlash to Trump because Trump is 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 is, is ridiculous at best. Um, since I am actually on an official program, but I think that it's it's more about a backlash against the institutional racism and classism in that 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 really is the fabric of the United States, right? And the the, the difference between Trump and Obama is that Obama has had more political savvy. Trump just doesn't have that political savvy. So so I think that I certainly think that there are some people that are backlashing Trump because Trump is saying ridiculous things, and you know he's talking about you know you loot, I'll shoot, all of these things that just make no sense. But it's more of a fight against institutional racism, which is directly connected to capitalism. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, M. Juba. May I turn to Colette? Uh, hello, Colette. Are you hearing oh us? 
Yeah, okay. I'm fine, thanks. Excellent, excellent. Um, just uh, connecting uh, what we've just uh, heard from Anjiva, do you feel that the um, what somebody uh, might have call, called the 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 gross um, racism of our current prime minister uh, in England? Uh, what's his name? I forget the guy. This old <laughs> uh, Johnson. Yeah, I, it, it, do you think that that has exacerbated matters? That, that has that has been one of the catalysts for this moment, if it's a moment in in British politics, where the the prevalence of racism, of institutional racism, of everyday racism, has reached a point where we we, we in England have just said, no, or the black communities in England have just said, we've had enough. Well, you know what? I think it's a, a culmination of um, a lot of things. Uh, whether it's the Conservative government, which we've had in in in, in power for uh, the last ten years in different combinations through um, coalitions and then by themselves, and uh, we've had a number of elections over the last ten years. We have to take in uh, to example the whole Brexit campaign and how that was um, uh, uh, the, the the manipulation within the whole Brexit campaign, the racism that came out of that. We have to take into consideration Grenfell and what came out of Grenfell. And we, we, we know that those that suffered uh, during that, 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 that terrible time were those people from the black community. Um, and also Windrush, you know, we, 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 we've just seen two years of uh, this government explain away why it is OK for them to deport our older generation, this generation that came to the UK, that built the UK on their backs through the NHS, through all these institutions, and they have been shipped off. You know, people have been left to starve in the house. There was a man that had to ply his teeth out of his mouth with plastic because he was no longer able to uh, receive benefits because of the Windrush generation. And now we've just gone through a period of six weeks where this government has said to our older generation, whether black or white, yeah, that you old people now have to lock yourselves in your houses, yeah, and, and basically die because that's what COVID is saying to them. So I think young people and the people of this country and perhaps internationally have said enough is enough. We're not taking it with, you know, the brutalization from the... Um, from the uh, uh, police and uh, those kinds of institutions, uh, the, you know, the education system, the, uh, the killing of young people uh, and, um, and the fact that uh, nothing's happened with it. You know, the CPS are, are not bothering to um, uh, 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 take to court perpetrators that have killed young people. And so I think we, we've just said enough is enough. And we've just seen this great emergence and uprising from young people coming out yep. and saying in the tens of thousands and saying, you know, enough is enough. That, that was a phenomenon that I saw in the last two or three weeks. And uh, I must say that uh, my daughter made this sign here, the Black Lives Matter sign that I have here. And if I duck down, uh, I tried to keep up with her, but... Uh, my own efforts lacked artistic uh, ability, but uh, the sentiment was there and the commitment was there. Um, but oh, Tariq, yeah. may I ask you, Tariq, um, this this militancy that I hear among the young, certainly in England, on the marches, uh, at cer certain risks to themselves given the COVID, um, is that a, is that a new thing, or do you have any knowledge of of the the history of of, of black militancy in Britain? Well, as you know, Pete, and perhaps those people who don't know, in 1981, we, we had a major, a sort of a youth rebellion in this country. And those moments when the state structures hold us down and hold us and tell us that we can't leave our houses, leave everything to the state, that they will look after us, there comes a moment when these things fall down. So what I see around me, I have my son who too has been on uh, on the demonstrations uh, around 
And I too tried to go, but for reasons I couldn't make it to the last one in Manchester. But the most important part, and I think uh, looking at both what Majiba and Colette have said, that these are not separate moments in time. These are historical events which are linked through a whole series of things and what readers in Pakistan, Kashmir or rest of the uh, viewers may not understand is when she's referring to Grenfell, this is where the fire and burns all these people down in London. So we come from multitudes of grievances, multitudes of pains. Our aches go down into history. So when I see the statues falling, when I see these symbols that have built this country and symbols of hatred, of racism, of pillage, of repression. And I see, in a sense, my own life and your life, Peter. Let's get back to you. You're not just here as a, somebody questioning uh, uh, us, but as your life. We had dreams and our dreams were so simple. We just wanted a fairer world, a just world. And that's why we turned to writing because we got, I certainly turned to writing because I was locked up and put in a prison. I had nothing else to do. I wanted the world to know my stories and moments of what we are witnessing today were there before. American black movement gave us a sense of hope. They gave us a sense of being, a sense of looking at a world. And that certainly shaped me, but perhaps you could explain, Pete, you know, what is it? Is this a moment that you're witnessing as a writer or is this a movement? Well, for me, uh, just to turn to how I arrived at creative writing, I actually started out working as a volunteer for the probation office in England uh, uh, with a view to trying to uh, stop the injustices in the criminal justice system occurring. And uh, after a while there, I realized that it was too late. You know, most people had been already, already been through the system. And so I then took up law. Uh, and I studied law. I studied law at Leeds University with a view to attempting to stop injustice occurring before it occurred, uh, before it before it got to court, if you like, you know. Uh, and I then came to the conclusion that that too was too late. That mm -hmm. once people are in that system, you, there's only so much a lawyer can do, a single lawyer. And at that point, I then turned to to writing, to to art, bizarre as it might seem, in that I thought maybe if we can change the world through our art, um, the injustices would not uh, occur. We would be able to stem them and overthrow these injustices and build a new world in my youthful dream. Uh, and uh, so that, and I've remained with the dream and I've remained a writer and I'm remained committed to, to a movement, not to a moment. This is a moment. But from the energy that I saw with the young people out there, you know, they're saying, you know, we've seen our, we've seen our parents suffer. As, as Claire said, you know, many of them work for the National Health Service. Many of them actually believed that the mother country was going to look after them. Um, and then there was a, another generation that uh, just the between generation, they, they, they saw this happen to their, their, their parents and they thought, well, we can amend the system by small increments. And they, they accepted their OBEs and their MBEs and, and they, 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 which are, are medals, the Order of the British Empire member of the British Empire, medals given out to those who who, who uh, contributed positively, but uh, it's almost in the way that they gave these medals or whatever, gongs out, that they were saying, you don't rock the boat too much, here you go, here's your reward, you can now stand with Colston next to the Colston statue with your medal or whatever. Um, th th these, these kind of compromise um, uh, solutions, if you like, uh, never affected change in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of root and branch way. And I think that we've re arrived now at this moment as part of the movement to overthrow all these minor incremental cosmetic changes and to say, you know, we need deep, deep change. We, we can't carry on simply talking about it. Let's act. And uh, I think that's where we're at now. Uh, but, sorry, go on. No, sorry, Colette, uh, it's your, it, it, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to pick up on something that you said about the, the changes that have happened over the last couple of years. And you, you mentioned the fact that they were um, yeah. cosmetic changes. But I think that the changes that we have brought in, when I say we, I'm talking about the black community, 
and um, Asian community, the, the, the political community, uh, have brought in changes um, that have uh, changed the landscape of the UK. You know, um, you know, uh, Tariq talked about the, the, the troubles in the 80s, you know, we, and from that we had, was it the Scarman report? That talked about the racism, the, the racism within the police. We had the McPherson report that came out talking about institutional racism. So people like Tariq, who have been doing that work for 20, 30 years, have had, have been doing a fantastic job and have been bringing in changes. And I think that's one of the criticisms that I have about this movement today is that young people, yes, it is your movement, it is your time, you have the capacity, you have the drive, you have the passion, you have even the naivety, yeah, to take this forward. But don't throw what we have done, and people like Tariq and yourself and all those, and Maviva and everybody else, don't throw that away, don't discount it, don't at all, honour it, yeah, honour it. That's all I'm saying, sorry. A bit yeah, can, 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 I, can I jump in on that on that point? Yes, please. Yeah, go I, ahead. Thank you. So I wanted to um, make make a couple of critical points. There's this um, um, meme or picture going around social media that says, you know, and it's like a young woman holding up a, a placard, and it says, you know, we are not our ancestors. We won't stand for this or something of that nature. And 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 the the contradiction that I have with that with that poster is you, we're not our ancestors we're not malcolm we're not martin we're not kwame Ture. you know we're not seku Ture. we're not marcus garvey we're not nat turner quite frankly i mean what we're doing compared to some of these you know african and latinos and asians and i mean and people from the global south what we're doing is minuscule right in in, in comparison to the contributions that they made but but so with that being said, I think that it's important for us to bridge the gap between sort of the youth of today or the movement of today. And it's also not just the youth, right? I think it's people who just got into the movement. They just learned that social, you know, that they had to get down because there was a problem. They could be 105 and still say, we, you know, we're not going to take this and we're going to change the world. But I think the issue that I have is that this is a protracted struggle. And, and, and the, the, the moment, um, that that we're experiencing now is 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 but a battle in the larger war, right? Um, and we've all made our contributions to that larger war. And and my position, um, I'm also a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. So our position also is not just about you know um, reform, which I I think that reform changes there there are small changes that that change the conditions of people's lives, but they don't totally change the system. So the problem that we have, if we're looking at police uh, violence or extrajudicial killings in the U.S., for example, is that you can go from Emmett Till, right? They got straight up lynched in the South for uh, allegedly whistling out a white woman by a mob mm -hmm. of white people, and he and he never they they never really got persecuted, right? Um, thrown in a river. And his mother had the, the bravery to have an open casket, right? You can go from Emmett Till to George Floyd. And, and along that trajectory, there have been protests, there have been fights, there have been organi organizations that have, made mon that have made changes, reforms, but because the system has not been completely torn down, we are gonna, we're gonna be here again. And, and let me just say that when I say the system being torn down, I'm not saying like one day capitalism is down, the next day socialism is up. I understand that economic systems, they, they transition and there's elements of, of each in both sides. But we have to also look at this from a long-term perspective and not also look at it from, from the immediate, what can we, how can we defund the police? Or I'm down with defunding the police, or how can we have body cams on the police? I'm down with having body cams, but that's not going to stop an African from getting killed in the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. Um, Derek? I was going to say that, you know, bo both you, Majiba, and Colette, you are, you are looking at the historical process. And when you raised the image of the young person holding a thing, we not like our ancestors. Well, what that young person doesn't realize, but even by holding the placard in her hand, she is 
the ancestor in time to come. So we are Absolutely. in one sense the ancestors of yet to come. And we were also connected with those who've gone before us. And in, in a way, Colette, we had uh, uh, already laid some of the examples. We, we talk about America, and that's important. But let's not forget where we are here as well in Britain, Majiba. In this yeah, country, agree. Agree. in this country, myself and my co-filmmaker friend called Ken Farrow, we made a film called Injustice about deaths in British police custodies. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, to this date, we were able to show how the British police get away mm -hmm. with murder, whilst the film is all, or killings, not always murder. How they get away with custodial killings, and we made a film about resistance. Most of the people who resisted, we did not set out to make a film about... Uh, 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 black people, we may set out to make a film about deaths in custody, but the ones who resisted were black. And it apparent, you know, if you look at the film to this date, the police in this country have succeeded in suppressing that film from terrestrial broadcast in Britain, though it's been shown at 70 film festivals across the mm -hmm. world. To those of your viewers, a petition is now going round actually demanding, I think in one day it got 1,500 signatures so far, demanding that they show these things. So firstly, there is an unbroken history of brutality. And let's never forget that the American monster is born out as the illeg illegitimate Absolutely. child of this country. How can we separate that? Now, as writers, would I have understood the world in which I live without Malcolm X? without Richard Wright, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because my experiences were the experiences of suddenly discovering that I was a person of color. Before coming to the white world, I didn't know. And a friend of mine, when I was very young, an African friend, he didn't know he was black. He actually, he didn't even know he was African. We were very young and we had no idea. I didn't know I was from this place or that place. I was seven years old. All I know, knew was my village, my family and stuff like that. So in that process, trying to understand in the world of fiction, certainly Majiba, what me and Peter and Melvin, and to those viewers who are shocked that we've lost Melvin, his internet is down, so we've let him okay. escape. <laughs> we so haven't edited him out. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't edited the only white man we had with us. It just, <laughs> and, and, and neither has he run away. The but, poor man. Yeah, yeah. Let me just come back to one of your things, the, 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 the general topic of, of where are we going with this and what are the strategies that we need to employ both as people and as writers. Um, my, my large starting point really is that uh, racism now and then was always, uh, its purpose was as an, exploit, an explanation for exploitation. Absolutely. You know, and, that, and yeah. that's where it's come from. Yeah. And its ramifications were huge. It went into all kinds of areas, biological, healthcare, education, uh, geography. There are so many implications after four or 500 years of this ideology permeating society, permeating language. The writer's task to, to overthrow that, to, to, to invent new worlds which are not hinged on that understanding of the world is huge. Just one example, one example, which is the, the map. I, I think everyone knows the Mercator map. It's the standard map that people uh, use uh, to explain. In, in fact, let me just lean one across a little bit. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's the Mercator map. And the Mercator map is are used throughout the world to explain this is how the world is. Actually, it's fully distorted, isn't it? And it is uh, actually centered everywhere where white people live or went, uh, is enlarged, inflated in its size. And that psychologically is saying to people that the white people are more important than anybody else. And well, they uh, are. <laughs> in, 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 in their feelings, you know? So in their, their life is worth more than mind. ours. Let's, their <laughs> life is worth more than ours. There's no question of it, you know? So we, we are faced with, you know, if you look at a map, something as simple and as seemingly objective as a map 
is fused with an ideology, with a way of understanding the world that privileges white people. And uh, turning to Colette, uh, I don't know what your experience of the education system in Britain was, but I do remember Professor Gus John in the 80s. He was an educationalist. He was fighting tooth and nail to try yeah. and change the education system, which failed black children. And I don't know if, if, if that's been something that you've touched upon yourself, uh, Colette, in terms of that fight or the CLR Jane's fight, that trying to validate uh, the, the, the contribution of black people to the world within the education system and so see that our young people get the education they deserve. Yeah, well, you know, as a, as a child in my, uh, you know, when I was about 10, 11, 12, that kind of thing, we were always encouraged to go to Saturday school, which, you know, is a, a, um, a, uh, uh, it was a, a space for black children to go to be able to get uh, help and support with uh, their education. Uh, and that's because at that time and, and well before that time, people had realized that uh, black children and the way that we were treated in school was totally different. And uh, and uh, in terms of the racism within the education itself. But there was also that book that is it Bernard Cord wrote about the uh, the the education, how to make a black child. Um, and I forget the title of it. But he wrote that book 50 years ago and then it was reprinted for 10 years ago. And mm. uh, and uh, the people that made contributions to that were people like Diane Abbott, Benjamin Zephaniah. But the mainstay of the book, the content of the book, the, you know, the talks about the racism and the racism within the structure, the fact that they are, you know, that they're, they're not teaching or upskilling teachers that are coming into inner city schools where majority of young black boys are you know white middle class women uh, about black culture you know because we, we know when when black boys are small they're cute but when they get bigger they're what they're sexual predators you know and these this is the, the, the this is the kind of mindset so it is about uh challenging not just challenging what's taught in school but how teachers are trained and I suppose it's about, really, let's take it back to school so we educate everybody, regardless of your skin colour, regardless of your sexu sexual orientation, regardless of your disability or anything, about world history and African history, black history, Asian history, Indian history, every single Australian history, Aboriginal history, should be included in that world history. And the part that Britain has played in slavery, colonization, imperialism, should be told and told truthfully. You know, if we're yeah. gonna set the record straight, let's set it straight. I, I remember, I think it was, um, what's his name now? Salman Rushdie, who said the problem for the English is that all their history happened elsewhere. In other words, the, the, <laughs> unlike for the United States, uh, the, the, clo the colonialism for, for England meant that the, the, the exploitation, the subjugation, the, the, the barbarity, which was all theirs, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, occurred over in the Caribbean, over well, in, 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 I, in the I, other... I, I, before Majiba, you come in, I'd like to counteract what Peter's just said. Don't yes, worry. we were subjected to untold barbarism and brutality across Africa, Asia, and everywhere that Britain went. However, never forget that young children died in the coal mines of Wales. That mm -hmm. they had them pulling, thing, you know, that they were as they were brutal to themselves. It, it wasn't an accident of history. I agree. I agree. Irish staff when they died in Wales, in the in that, that was Lord Penryn of Penryn Castle, who also owned the estates in Jamaica, and he was, my, you know, the exploitation there, you know, was of a, of a, of a degree more severe than than the coal mine exploitation. But nevertheless, I agree with the idea that there are alliances to be made. Uh, but my point, really, that, that I wanted to make was that the education we're given is one of a mission. And then of, 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 of vaunting the wrong things. And that's why the Edward Colston statue is mm -hmm. up there. It's telling a story to the people. It's uh, in a kind of soft education uh, of the people saying, these are the people you should revere. 
And the beautiful right. thing that the young people did was to tear it down and say, sorry, wrong story. Majiba, right, right. Yeah, Majiba, you, yeah. Go ahead. You're an educationalist, and this is very much part and parcel of your existence mm -hmm. and being how to move uh, forward, be, you know, move forward on this situation. There's two questions. Should we bother educating white people? Should mm -hmm. or you know, should we let them deal with the problems that they are a product of? We've had no choice but to learn about this. What do you think? Yeah, well, and before I answer that question, I just want to also throw something in because I think it's important. You you raise a very interesting point, uh, Tariq, about what what's happening in the UK, and I think that we have to be clear that like police terrorism, you know, extrajudicial killings are happening all over the world. I mean, Afro Brazilians are being killed at ridiculous numbers, you know, throughout sort of Latin America and other spaces, you know, and, and even throughout the continent, for example, you know, the, the militarization, the police and, and military are being trained by AFRICOM, right? And, and so I just want us to, to remind ourselves that this is not just about one or two bad police or, or a couple of people that happen to be racist. This is about an ideology which reinforces this capitalist system, right? Yes. So I think that that's something that I, I just want to make sure that I, I clearly get through. And I think in regards to educating, who do we educate? So here's my position. I think there's white people and then there's white supremacy, right? And the average white person doesn't, isn't, doesn't necessarily control anything. Let's not confuse ourselves, okay? So like your white neighbor or the white person on the train or the white, they, they don't, they don't, they're not controlling your life. They're benefiting from white supremacy, yes, but they're not controlling your, your life. And so I think that, and, and the, the, here's, here's the, the, it's not funny, but it's, 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 it's kind of ironic, is that unfortunately this capitalist system brainwashes the majority of white people to believe somehow that they have more power than they have, right? And so you somehow think that because you benefit from white supremacy that you actually have more power than the African or the Asian or whoever, but you too are being oppressed and exploited. And so here's what I would suggest. One, I think that it's important for us to edu use education to transform the political main move. That also includes people of European descent. However, that doesn't mean that that's, I don't think that it's not our job to go and, and uh, educate any ignorant Europeans. That, that's not my job. I don't have the time for it. I have to, to, to educate and transform the ideology of African, brown, Latino, and Asian people, right? That's my priority. But, but, but there does need to be an education, political education process for people of European descent. And that needs to also be led by people of European descent. There's plenty of, of organizations that have white people, Europeans in them, people of European descent that are conscious, that are progressive. They need to be doing that work inside their community and they need to be exposing their community so that they know that you two are oppressed, right? And so that, 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 that would be my suggestion. At the end of the day, education and truth is truth. And whoever has access to that truth, I, I suspect that they'll change the way that they view themselves in relationship to the world, globalization, and even oppression. And let me, let me give you a quick example. So before I moved to Ghana, I was adjuncting at a, community, at a, a university that's a historically black university and college in DC, but it's really also like a, a, a community college and a, a four-year university for anyone who wants to come to, you know, who wants to go to school at night, workers, blah, blah, blah. And so I was teaching a class on diversity. And I asked every student to do a presentation about who they are. And culturally, so you had, and, and the, the room was mixed. There were Africans born in the U.S., Africans born on the continent, Africans born in the Caribbean, there were Asian folks, there were white people born in the US, um, and then a couple of you know, sprinkles of other people in the room. White people really struggled with identifying who they were, right? And so several of these white young ladies said, oh, I'm an American. I said, but what is American culture? Oh, I was born in here, I was born there, but where'd your people come before America? They had no idea, confused, co complete confusion. 
So even in that moment, I was challenging these people, these young students of European descent to realize that you're not an American unless you're an indigenous, unless you're Native American, unless you're native to the land, you're not. And even if you've been in this camp for a thousand years or 500 years, your people came from somewhere else. And so one, one young lady was like, oh, I'm Irish and I'm Scottish and I'm this and I'm that. And I'm like, well, you know, quite frankly, it's a shame that you can't speak any of the languages from where your people come from. That's and, and that means what what cultural nuances are you missing, right? Well, for, not, for not being able to speak the languages. My, she was dumbfounded. She couldn't speak. My my gut feeling is that there is a a subliminal sense that many white people carry with them that they're actually supermen, superwomen. They oh, yeah. they are they are a race apart, and they and that black folk. Getting anywhere near the power that they hold is rather like the kryptonite coming near Superman. It, it, they feel that their power is weakening the closer we get to the center of the power. Because why else would in publishing, the publishing industry, there be so few black editors in the publishing industry? There'd be so few directors, mm -hmm. chief executives in the publishing industry. Why else? In the theatres, and I can mention Manchester, but I presume it's the same all over. You know, there are, there are very, very few artistic directors of theatres in, in, in Manchester. And I think I've been in, in, in that world for 30, 40 years. I don't think I've seen more than one. Yeah, yeah there you go. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we're, there, 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 so there, there is a willful ignorance. Um, I think Absolutely. somewhere in, in the background of their minds, they're thinking, you know, I'm just so good at my job. No black person could get near... The, the level of brilliance that I hold. And so then comes the training programs, editing programs, mentoring programs. We'll help you with your grammar and your spelling and we'll help you with your world building program. Anything but relinquishing power. Because well, that is the sense they have that, you know, we are the ones with this, with this brilliance. And that in terms of educating them that they are not actually exceptional. Educating. Absolutely. Out of their exceptionalism is, is a hard work, but Tari, yeah, you know. yeah. I think Colette and me, you know, we, we share a lot of these uh, stories, Colette, of how, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there is an underlying thing, which hopefully we'll be doing a discussion on Pandemicus in the coming time on uh, white privilege and how mm -hmm. actually it's our intellectual, our cultural, our artistic labor is you know the, who are the music promoters who are the yeah. publishers who mm -hmm. are the boxing promoters where does the money get made all these sports and things there is a culture of exploitation and it hasn't yeah. stopped all that has done it has just metamorphosed it's changed a little bit and perhaps Colette, you know our common experiences are quite similar in that and you know we, we've not we've taken a lot of time and kept you a little bit out of this for a bit now, Colette. Well, I was hoping, Colette, you would come to CLR James and the work you've done trying to get that centre reinvigorated. The neglect of CLR James is an appalling indictment of mm -hmm. the ignorance of the, 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 the world community for his contribution to, to knowledge. But tell us about that, if you can, Colette. Yeah, well, you know what, uh, uh, fellow um, speakers and, and, and listeners, <laughs> You know, this, uh, this fight for uh, equity and, uh, and, 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 and the demand to say that Black Lives Matter, I know that's a, a new tag, a new phenomenon tag, but the, the intent behind it has always been there, is great. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a hard battle. Uh, and, and, and people within that uh, fight face trauma all the time and we have a building here in Manchester called the Nella James Centre which uh, is dedicated to CLR James who was a, a, a pan-Africanist and a, a, a fighter uh, and challenging the racism and injustice uh, in the world uh, for many you know for over 60 70 years of his life and uh, the, the building called Nella James Centre has served the black community of Manchester uh, for the last, it has been in the community for 40 years, but over the wow. last 10 years or so, it has fallen into disrepair. Oh. Now, th th there's, a, there's, a, 
there's a long story and a long history behind the whole thing about CLR James, which, you know, I, I don't think, we, I, I think that in itself deserves a, 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 a whole conversation in itself. But what we're finding is that our demand that this building, uh, this institution, this space, uh, this place um, is is allowed to be kept within the black community, led by the black community for the black community. And we're finding it extremely hard to get any help or support from the local council and the local government. And I think that that in itself is an example as to how the, the, the authorities, the uh, city council, uh, the political parties don't value what it is that we need to the resources that we need in our community to um just to have a better just 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 to have a somewhere to go somewhere to teach somewhere to um uh, uh somewhere to be safe and uh so yeah and that's it and i'm sorry that i haven't gone into a lot about clr james but at the moment fam i'm traumatized I can't take, I'm, 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 we're, we're taking on a lot here. We're taking on that 500 year struggle that we've been through. We're taking mm. on this moment at the moment. And, you know, and, and for me, this moment has to be defended and it has to be defended by black people because from mm. where I stand or where I sit and where I stand, not where I'm kneeling, but where I stand for me, that this movement is being um, overtaken by uh, white people. And so, uh, you know, and, and, and if we look into this whole question of kneeling for nine minutes, you know, the amount of time that the police officer knelt on George Floyd's neck. So I understand the sentiment in that. I understand, you know, that the symbolic reason for that well, as a as as my ancestors were warriors, yeah, fighters, revolutionaries, pan Africanists, civil rights movements going all the way through. I have never seen a movement. I have never seen a revolutionist be down on a knee and asking for justice. It just hasn't happened. Absolutely, um, Colette. Absolutely. absolutely, you've taken some of the words right out of my mouth. I am sick to death of seeing mm -hmm. people, particularly white people, kneeling. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, Keir Starmer, the leader of the bloody Labour Party, who goes sucking up to the Zionists and the right-wing neo-fascists within India, he's doing a salute. Give us a break. Yeah. A policeman in America with a gun yeah. behind him is kneeling. Yeah. No, yeah. it was right. Because when they when they took the knee, mm -hmm. it was against the American anthem. It yeah, wasn't yeah. just for the sake of the wretched thing. This is when symbolism becomes uh, devoid of substance. Not only mm -hmm. is it shallow, but it's reactionary. Now, we have to have faith in the world. It took a pandemic. We are getting a lot of questions on my screen. And we will, dear oh. viewers, come to some questions in a few minutes. And perhaps we, in the last 13, 14 minutes, we do take the questions. It takes a pandemic of a, an imprisonment of countries, if not the world, for us to break out. And yes, Colette is right. We're all suffering the trauma. And one of the points, unfortunately, our uh, Melvin is not here. One of the points we were going to also discuss, uh, you know, that some white writers are scared of being accused of being racists. Don't be. The fear is from racism. You know, we've we've had plenty of it throughout our lives. Now, if with all your permission, perhaps we could take a, a question and each of us uh, maybe throw a, a little bit of uh, our sentiments. I'll we would take the first question. And if I miss people out, it's because we're dealing with a lot of things. We're talking to the viewers. Here's a question from Sarah. I'm kind of sick of people saying to me, I'm not racist. I'm ignorant. Educate me. 
I think we've been touching upon that, but perhaps quick views on that, and we'll see if we can take one or two more questions on that. My very quick answer is for anybody who wants to learn about racism, great uh, experiment conducted, the brown eye, blue eye experiment. If you just Google that, find, find that, have a look at it. That will reveal in, in a very sharp way uh, how racism operates. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't waste my time on people and trying to explain racism to people who, people saying, I'm not racist, ig I'm ignorant, explain it. I don't have time for that. I'm trying to organize my people, period, end of story. And if you're ignorant, that's not my problem. Listen, if I want to be a chemist, okay, am I going to come to a, somebody who's a chemist and say, I'm not a chemist, I'm ignorant, can you educate me? No, I'm going to go and get a, a degree in chemistry. So people who are ignorant of racism, they need to pick up a book, they need to look on the YouTube, they need to go to, to the, to, to, to the uh, Google, right? And do some research, because you can research everything else. I'm not your, I, I, I don't work for you, you know? I work for the masses of people. Colette? I'm with Michiba. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what I would like to say to Sarah, is that one of the things is that we always, and Majiba made a distinction between people with white power and white people. Absolutely. The one thing I would like our white friends to understand, they're actually white is a political color and not a color of skin or pigmentation. And therefore that is not an issue. And I, I want to take us back to a little bit of what Colette was saying in terms of, well, you know, CLR James and the disrepair of what little monuments they were. This is the time when the racist statues are falling down, or some of them are falling down. We've yet got to get to the Queen Victorias of this world and what they what was done in their I'm name to it. <laughs> well, Winston Churchill and the barbarism that he did. But my the point is by resurrecting those people, not just my you know my, Martin Luther's King's dream. But Mel, uh, Martin, um, uh, Malcolm X's by any means uh -huh. necessary, that when these figures become normal, they were normal people. There was nothing wrong with them. All they said was, why have you, who taught you to hate yourself? There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. These were not great complex things. And yeah. hopefully by the acceptance of the figures of our resistance, can some aspects of the history be uh, taken? It seems that uh, if we go now to one more person. Sorry, sorry. Be be before we go to that person, in, in, in terms of educating white people about racism, I would like to say that what we need to be careful about is this next uh, ebb of uh, training and educating white yes, people, yes. especially within the workforce, because I can hear a lot of uh, this unconscious bias kind of training coming through. You oh, know, yeah. The, 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 oh yeah, the, yeah, and, uh, oh yeah, and and a lot of and a lot of uh, you know statements coming out about you know that we're supporting black people and stuff and that. But if you, I mean, I, I had a, a conversation with a, a young boy, twenty two, who is already saying that. Going back to his workplace, he's already asked, what, what are you, as my workplace, what are you putting in place, yeah, uh, 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 in, in regards to what is happening in terms of COVID, in terms of, you know, uh, the, 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 um, the uprisings of Black Lives Matter. And the response to that was, oh, we sent out an email like three weeks ago. So when this person's gone back to the email of three weeks ago, it's a long email and right at the very bottom, it, it makes reference to what's happening in terms of George Floyd, but it doesn't talk about what specifics that that company is going to be doing to support their black members of staff. But if I, just a couple of things Sorry. I'd like to add, if I can. We've, this is not new. We've been in this so-called race all. awareness thing. It's an industry. Yeah. It's a complete fraud. It's been yeah. here for a long time. Uprisings of 1981 led to all sorts of industries in Britain. Lots of people of you know African and Asian descents made great mm -hmm. amounts of money out of it. They that set up course, monitoring yeah. center here, monitoring center there, this thing here, that thing there. A whole new class 
was created that was co-opted. So we've been yeah. here before. Yeah. If you want to learn about what's going out, get out on the streets. Go find mm -hmm. out. Go resist. Go fight your own demons. I've always Absolutely. fought your demons. So what I'd like to say really in, in this is perhaps take one or two more. I'm sorry, I'm sort of doing the technical side here. We have clearly the issue of taking this so-called, oh, knee, I think I've got the wrong person here. I think this is it, you know, is the taking the knee, take the knee. Well, I'd like to take it off, but you know, <laughs> what's your opinions? A quick few things on that and then we round up and you know say the important things we wish to say my my feeling is uh let me visit you in two or three years and then see what you've done never mind <laughs> taking a knee in plot fields one day you know that's a nice virtue signaling it may be honest it may be true great no but i i'll, I'll take a rain check and then we'll come back to it and see what you're actually done <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that response. <laughs> well, we don't have to. <laughs> but but I, I agree. But I also think that see here's 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 where where rebellions and protests and let's be clear that this is a rebellion. It's not looting. It's not yeah. rioting. It's yeah, really yeah. not even protesting. It's rebellion. This is where to get co-opted. Everyone and their mama taking a knee. These democratic uh these democratic senators that uh, they're taking a knee. The democratic Party. Taking a knee with Kente cloth, okay? Oh. Are you sure? With Kente cloth, are you sure? You see what I'm saying? So everyone yeah. is now taking a knee. So how can the very per the very institution of the police that's that's ultimately here to protect private property, right? And the institution and the state now take a knee with the somebody who's trying to fight against the oppression of this institution. So I think that there's this symbol is ultimately co-opting this struggle, right? And that co-option ultimately means that as um, our, our colleague here said, not the correct people are gonna be taking over these protests. Colette? Um, I'm not taking the knee. And for reasons that I've discussed before, I mm. my, my spirit, yeah, my spirit, the spirit of my ancestors, uh, uh, all those that have gone before me and uh, and my children, both me and my son were on that demo on Saturday in Manchester and I told him I wasn't taking the knee. I stood there when hundreds of thousands of people took the knee and I refused to. Simple. I, I would like to just move the discussion to a positive level in one sense. Mm -hmm. Those people, thank you, Anne, for your question, that clearly those who wish to stand in solidarity should stand in solidarity. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And it's not that the desire to be part and parcel of a movement, that uh, the, 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 what differentiates us is not the pigmentation of our skins, but actually the power structures of the society, which has made the issue of racism far more than skin deep. So to, so to say. So in that sense, I think that without the building of a very broad anti-racist movement, an anti-racist mm -hmm. movement that must be a threat to white privilege and white power. But I agree. A threat to white people. And those of us who write I it agree. out, yeah, I'd like I, to bring it, sorry, Pete. I, I no, I'm just agreeing with you. I'm just agreeing with you, Tari, carry on. Okay, so one of the things is that as, we you know this is a, a platform, and I'd like to just perhaps you don't know, but today we are actually streaming out to Kashmir from where we've had people saying hello and sending us messages of solidarity and so on in Pakistan. Uh, I think we've even got a country called Scotland, even from there, we got some messages and things. So, in a way, clearly, this is an important historical moment. How will it shape our writing? Well, it certainly will feature in uh, like the great historic events of the, the Russian mm -hmm. revolution, of the Chinese revolution. This is no small moment in human history. Mm -hmm. This human history has not only stripped the pandemic right apart, and some of these kids are not stupid. They've got elderly parents. They know if they go on the march, they're putting people potentially in danger. But when we live in a society 
in which butchers with knives in their hands are treating us like a herd of cattle just simply to be slaughtered where they've got rid of 60,000 elderly and and you know people of not just elderly in this country and how on earth is the people people of this country sitting back and not infuriated not only toppling the symbols of racism that have held them in bondage themselves including us but also rebelling so in a way what i'd like to say peter and perhaps all of us to our writer friends who are in the main those uh, are, are watching us and non-writers that everything around us has given us so much material for thought exactly. opened up so many and racism the struggle against racism is just a key that will unlock many other negative isms without trolling down in those directions we can't like uh, be like white writers sitting in some palace writing about public schools or whatever else and there i'll end my bit and give it to the three of you we've gone silent well, you I, need I the think cues in <laughs> Peter, your comments to those who are writing, our white writers, our friends. We have five more minutes, and then we have we okay. need two minutes to round up on ourselves. Okay. okay, with regard to the publishing industry, question of power. How much power are you prepared to give up? Tariq's very right. Colette's very right. We've had all these reports uh, coming out of England about uh, discrimination, how we're going to tackle it. In the publishing industry, we've had reports every three, five years. I think the last one was produced by, uh, in, on young adult literature, was produced by Dr. Ramshadan Bold, I believe, uh, the publishing deficit, I think it was called. And basically, short story, very few black writers, very few black characters, and very few black people in positions of power in the publishing industry. Let's let's go move the, the dialogue forward. In three years time will this be the same it mm. will be the same unless you the white people give something up you know that's not happening uh, right well in that case <laughs> that's why we get this this Absolutely. movement you know resistance and power as Malcolm X says is never given it's taken and the demographics are changing there's a bigger black community in, in Manchester the 60 percent of school age children are non-white you know, who, who's, are they continuing to read only white characters by white writers? I don't think so. So there's an economic imperative for the publishing mm. industry to change. But nevertheless, think from the right writer's point of view, the right publishing industry people's point of view, what are you prepared to give up? You know, are you going to prepare to give up nothing? In which case, everything will be lip service until we seize the, the power that we need to seize. Uh, writers themselves, uh, the white writers. Uh, okay, I used to go to a workshop. I won't mention which one. And I think I went there for 10 years and there was not one white white one black character produced by white writers in their yeah. fictional worlds and after so many years i said yeah what, what happened to us you know you step out of the office and we're all over the place but we never make it into your stories what's that about so as Tariq said you need courage yeah it, it, it can be daunting to write a black character if you don't know any black people and if that in, in itself is telling but do the work do the research, get out, talk to black people and, and try. You may get it wrong, but it's okay. We all get things wrong. Black writers, well, you know, the publishing industry as it stands now sometimes says, please sell your soul. You know, they want you to write a story that is convenient and easy for their readership, their imagined yeah. readership. Hold out, write the story you want to tell. And in time, it will be read. Absolutely. Colette? Well, uh, I, I'm not a writer, and uh, but I, I I do take to Facebook every now and again, and you know uh, write down my thoughts and and stuff. But um, I think that it's important that uh, Black women's voices are heard through this struggle, um, and uh, you know I'm just going at the moment through an incident that uh, is, is trying to silence my voice. You know, a black woman is an activist and her voice is trying to get silenced and, uh, and, and that's by a white ally. Uh, and I, I just, and I, and so to writers, I just think, you know, if there's a space and there's help and the support for those who are marginalized, well, you know, help break them out of that. Fantastic. And guys, listen, my, my admin is terrible today. I've got 30 seconds left on my battery. So I'm going to go back. 
Right Thank back. Thanks, Gabby. <laughs> and I hope we can take this conversation up again. We yes. can. Thank you so much for your time, Colette. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. I thank you very much for being invited. I am absolutely, I was, I'm absolutely honoured. Trust oh, me. You're Majiba, it was nice meeting you. So well, nice to meet you. Your summary, okay. Majiba, please. Yeah, so, so I think my summary is going to be really quick. I think we need to tell our own story and stop depending on anyone else to publish us, anyone else to tell our story. Because the reality is the oppressed, I mean, the oppressor will never tell the oppressed story, right? And so certainly, and in, in, in my field in African studies, you know, we have all of these international journals, which are, you know, the impact journals. And if we don't publish in them, we're, 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 we're nobody scholar. And my thing is, we need to begin to promote our own journals, publishing houses, books, stories, told from our own perspective, whatever that perspective is, and respect the perspective. End of the day. We shouldn't, we cannot depend on a system which is about oppression to then somehow free us even in the writing circles. So that's all I'm saying. We can't, you can't decolonize a neo-colonial institution. Thank you so much for that. And in conclusion then, is that there are, we were meant to do a, a couple of things on, uh, pandemicus like a free book draw to those of you who are waiting please we weren't scamming you really lots of things have come in the way in time to come and once again please for those of you who are used to seeing melvin burgess with his great big smile on here today he's probably laughing because he didn't have to do any more work with us today but his internet was down to those of you who've taken your valuable time to us the sum total for us is that this movement is important. The journey that this movement has opened up, it's a lesson for me. It's a lesson for all of us. Thank you very much for joining, and we'll see you soon. I think we're cooking up a program on white privilege, what it is, how we ought to get rid of it, and how we're all sick of it. But that's yet to come. See you now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.